All right. Well, welcome, welcome. Another awesome night here. I, I don't know about all you, but we're getting the itch pretty bad up in musky country. Um, starting to... Yep, it's that final, final stretch. I know some folks down south are probably letting them rest, but um, just want to do a quick housekeeping, housekeeping, excuse me. Um, thanks to everybody that's been joining us as we go in. You guys know the drill. For those folks that are new, um, webinar style format. So you're just going to see me and our guests tonight on your screens, but we do want to hear from you. Uh, so down below, you got a chat button that will... Um, You'll see that going all night and just make sure that you hit um, all panelists and attendees. All panelists and attendees. That's what, that way everybody uh, who's on the call can see what's going on. Yeah, I'll click that, sorry. And then uh, questions, if you have questions, we wanna hear from you throughout uh, Q&A button. That's a lot easier for us to keep the questions kind of off to the side so we make sure we hit them. And um, what else, what else, what else? Going for about an hour. We will. We are recording this, so uh, we'll be posted if you want to tune back in or you have to hop off. Um, and that's really about it. I'm excited to get into it. What's that's that? good. Oh, so, well, that's sorry. Technical issues. Hold, bear with us. Well, while, while I'm doing that, Eric, we are pumped to have you, brother. Hey, man. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, before we really dig into it, I just want to say thanks to you and Jen for. Uh, for giving me a spot on these sessions and you guys have had a fantastic lineup so i'm i'm truly honored to be here and and to be supporting some upper midwest yeah. yeah dude no we're, we're excited to have you we had some of the ogs and we got to get that infuse that new blood into it too get some get some new representation right. so. well, i'm going to do my best tonight so good good well yeah. kick us off a little bit um you know Give us the spiel. Where are you from? Yeah, what, man. Um, how did how did weights and measures come about? Like, sure. like, give us the lowdown. If uh, if folks aren't familiar with me, my name's Eric. Uh, I live in kind of the West Metro Twin Cities in Minnesota, and uh, it is a ten and two shirt that I've got on. Thank you. Um, but uh, you know, I got I got into fly fishing almost twelve years ago, and I I started fishing the driftless for trout, and moved into some warm water after that, and you know, made a natural progression right into to pike and muskie and, and um, really took that full force this, this last fall. Uh, and so weights and measures for me came about as a way to um, just kind of channel some of that creative energy into something a little more productive and um, had the, the really fortunate opportunity to be able to start selling some of my product and, and that really started taking off last September. Um, and so it's, you know, for me, it's, it's not just really great musky flies. It's um, materials that I'm sourcing myself. Uh, I actually started down that rabbit hole getting into some bucktail and dyeing my own bucktail and, and that sort of thing and then went right into feathers and, and shanks and all that stuff. Uh, and so what one of the things I love about the things that I'm doing out here are um, I'm trying to be as local as possible. I'm trying to find materials from Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, all the bucktails is sourced by me. Uh, from Wisconsin Whitetail, um, and it's Eric driving around on the road picking up roadkill. Just let him be. He's doing his thing. <laughs> you know, I haven't gotten to that point quite yet, but I got desperate I'm enough. Absolutely, uh, taking a second look as I see those things as I drive by. So, who knows? That's hilarious. I got a text from Jen last night as she was walking the dog, and she spotted some AAA Magnum tails supposedly. So it's it gets in the blood. <laughs> that's good that's good no and i would just echo that i think uh well first of all i i don't know it but kind of the class of september 2020 because that's right when musky fool kicked off so yeah hopefully, exactly hopefully good vibes um from that <laughs> but yeah when i first started chatting with you that was one of the coolest things was um you know it's kind of this style that you had some classic patterns but yeah. taking the local materials taking your own slant to it and we're going to get into all that tonight um, yeah, I mean, and you know, that really came from my, my just passion in fly tying. I've always been one to go way down the rabbit hole, find as much out as I can about everything that I'm tying, and that was the exact same way with, with musky flies. Um, you know, I wanted to find some materials that I could kind of showcase and represent the upper Midwest. Uh, I wanted to find some materials that I thought could work a little bit better in, in the way that I'm using them in my flies. Um, but then also it's just part of the craft for me. You know, I love, I love the, the complexity of, and, and sort of the variation in, in house dyed product. 
Um, I like the, the unique qualities to everything. Um, and so everything that you'll see up on my site and the things that I've got to show you guys tonight are gonna be very, very unique, maybe a little bit different um, color schemes and color palettes that, that you might be used to, but um, it's, all, it's all homegrown right here. Hell yeah. Before we get too deep down the rabbit hole, because I don't think I'll be able to pull us out once we go, what, um, when it comes to like fly tires, you know, obviously we're talking about Bufords and Bucktail. So inspiration wise, I'm sure, you know, Mr. Mr. Bowen's influenced most of us. But yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, he's, he's you get been a phenomenal resource for me. Um, and I've been super fortunate to be able to fish with him and, and meet up with him a handful of times. Um, and just an all around incredible resource in the community. So that's been a lot of fun to, to get to know. And um, that's absolutely where I got my start and kind of got, got pulled into musky stuff was, was through Brad. Um, you know, Mark Burns over at Urban Fly Co has been a, an, another awesome resource for me. He and I have been chatting all, all time season and he's been uh, very quick to offer advice and, and suggestions and, and feedback. Um, so that's another, another big one for sure. And then, of course, I mean, you got to think about folks like uh, Blaine Chocolate and, and those, some of those bigger guys who are doing kind of that really high-level fly stuff. Um, kind of mixing it up a little bit and, and changing some of the directions that we're all going in with flies. Yep. Sure. Did you, I, I intentionally going to not say changing the game, but that's just too, I, cheesy, hey, too easy. But I, was, what's I, didn't, I didn't say it. But um, – Brushes, like that's, I think, the, the big thing that is unique. Uh, you, you know, I mean, there are other people using brushes, but I think when it comes to commercially tied flies, especially bucktail, it's not the most common. And uh, that's been kind of the, the core to your style. Like just at the highest level, you know, for someone that is either skeptical, doesn't use them, likes the old way, like what, what's the benefits? Why should people be yeah, sure. I mean, look at tying with brushes? What I like about it is that, you know, bucktail is a really cool fiber. You know, I love that it's a natural fiber and it's got its own kind of unique qualities to it. But um, one of the big benefits for me uh, is consistency, especially if you're tying, you know, a hundred of the same pattern, you can get the same taper, you can get the same weight, that sort of thing. Um, so you can end up with a really, really consistent profile, really consistent taper, really consistent fly if you're trying to tie many of the same color or the same pattern. Um, I also find that you're able to use a little bit less material when you throw a bunch of bucktail into a brush. Um, you can achieve the same sort of height and profile without having to pack quite as much of that hair onto the hook or the shank. Uh, so you can end up with a lighter fly, something that's maybe a little bit easier to cast and um, something that'll shed water a little bit more quickly just because it's not quite as dense. So that was another big one for me when I was really kind of getting into some of this bucktail brush work for sure i that was the first thing i noticed when i got your flies mm -hmm. uh, we got we got a bunch of them here check them out on the site at musky fool and weights and measures but i mean that's that's like easily 16 inches 15 inches and it's nothing you know yeah. i think that was the first thing i noticed and i i didn't know if it was your style or if it was strictly the brushes or a little yeah, bit of both but that's i think it's a little bit of both um i tend to use a little bit less material kind of overall i, I just think um you know i like to let the material speak for themselves and rather than trying to throw everything on at once um but yeah the, the weight for sure you know if you're able to drop some of that weight down a little bit you're going to appreciate it at the end of an eight hour float for sure for sure well and and i think it's, it's going to offer something to like it's going to fish differently you know in terms of, for sure um, and that's like for folks that have been with us i think that's the cool thing about the, all the perspectives we've had so far that i've learned is you know you have a, a fly like what eric's putting together and then compare that to something like what david holmes is putting together and it might be like three or four times the bucktail very different but that's the, that's the beauty is the difference uh yeah. you know different action different different construction and there's no right or wrong you know so we we love we love this stuff yeah, you know one of the one of the things i really wanted to kind of plug tonight was that as we kind of come to the end of tying season i've been seeing a lot of folks asking for feedback on the things they've been working on all winter asking if things are right or wrong what, what are the right tools for this scenario and, and really what it comes down to is you got to fish them you know, you got to get these things in the water. You got to see what your fishing style is like. You got to figure out what kind of water you're in. Um, and 
practice, tie a bunch of flies, fish all of them, make subtle changes, get back on the water. Uh, that's really the best advice that I can give for folks who are really starting to get into some, some more intense tying stuff. Yep. And, and I, I just like building on that, I think more to plug what I see you doing here is like, I think, I think it was actually Mr. Bill Shear in the, in the musky Facebook group, someone might've asked for some feedback and he said, the only feedback that matters is, is the old, old Miss musky. And, right. um, but at the same time, you know, the direction of like so much material, so beautiful, you know, is it, is it catching fish or is it catching fishermen? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I would I would love to see how quickly we don't we're not going to do it tonight, but how quickly you can put one of these together because not only looks good, it's got all the fishy fishy aspects with the shank. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, the shank stuff. Uh, but it's fast and it kind of is also that like guide fly. And I think sometimes like we miss that in musky. It's just get it in the water. Get, you know, yeah, totally. Tying doesn't have to be its own art. It can mm -hmm. be a means to an end. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that kind of touches on. Um, you know, you mentioned all the aspects of a good musky fly. I, I want to just plug really quick the feathers that I'm using um, <clears throat> because these are coming right from Root River Hackle here in Lanesboro, Minnesota. Um, what I found was that I was, I was buying materials that were either way too stiff and they weren't giving me the movement that I wanted, or I was using dry fly hackle and it was coming right off the hook or it was, it was breaking or it was getting chewed off. Um, and what I was able to find through those guys was something right in the middle where you have a nice wide profile you have a, a fairly flexible uh quill stem in the center and so you get a lot of really swimmy action you get a lot of wiggle but it's going to hold up you know for for more than a day uh and so for me that was kind of where i started experimenting a little bit more with my patterns and figuring out how i can tweak them to be a little bit less you know, less intense with materials, less intense with feathers and, and fur and all that. Yeah, big, big shout out to those folks too, Root River. It is funny though, whenever, you, I'm sure you encountered this when you were like saying you're going to buy a bunch of schloppen. They're like, what are you using that for? You know, that's the First junk. That's junk. Down there, he was like, I mean, I guess I could put some in a bag. Nobody wants this crap. What are you doing? <laughs> But no, the more that I that we got to talking, I was able to kind of get him to wrap his head around what I was doing with them. And, and once he caught on, then he was like, oh yeah, I've got exactly what you're looking for. Yep, that's um, awesome. Yeah, they're really good, really good folks out there. Um, kind of back to brushes. Talk us, so we talked a little bit about the benefits. Um, are there are there any cons? I mean, I, I can try and make some up, but you probably have a better, better. Sure, yeah, I mean, you have to have a bit of an understanding of, of the bucktail you're working with. Um, not every, I mean, if you've used any bucktail at all, you know right off the bat that one tail is going to be a little bit different than the next one that you're going to get. Some of the fibers are going to be really straight. Sometimes they're going to have kind of that waviness to them. Um, and then, you know, length, obviously, some of them are going to be super long or some of them are going to be short that you can't really do anything with. So you have to kind of have an understanding of how those different kinds of fibers are going to work together. Um, and the brush making process is a little bit more intense than just using like a regular dumping brush table and sort of that traditional brush making process. Um, we'll get into, into some of that in just yeah. a minute. But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an art in and of itself. And, you know, if, you, if you're not into that, I totally get it. It's, it's another one of those elements of fly fishing though that I love that if you're interested and if you're into it, you can open up a whole new window into how you're designing your flies, how you're putting material onto a hook or onto a shank. Um, it's just another tool in your toolbox that you, that you have access to. Yeah. How do you, I think one of the questions uh, we get asked about it, you know, when do you tie with brushes? And, and I don't a lot of the time, but um, is the time, you know, does it, does it save time? Does it add time? Like it's another step, but it's also less time at the vice with the fly. Does it really matter? Uh, yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think once you get once you get into it and once you start getting rolling, it, it does save some time. There obviously is some back end work, you know, there's a little more materials prep, a little bit more that you have to do before you sit down with the vise. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, I think you get a, a clean, consistent end result. And that tying process is much faster. So yeah. you're, you're able to spend a little bit more time thinking about perhaps the taper of your fly, 
the, the color blend if you're changing some colors throughout the, the length of the course of the fly. Um, and little, a little bit less worrying about, you know, is this pinch of bucktail going to be the right amount, you know, for my reverse tie and, and that sort of thing. Which is nothing against the traditional method. I, I use a reverse tie of bucktail on, on tons of my patterns and it's an incredibly useful tool to know how to do. And I think you should know how to do that whether or not you're working with, with brushes. Yeah. Um, but, you know. So you're I, saying that like my traditional style, just getting drunk at the vice and slapping materials together doesn't really lend itself well to. <laughs> if you're going for consistency, perhaps not. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, like I, yeah, I was about to say that. Or late night, you know, jam sessions where you might not remember the fly, but you see it the next morning and you go, oh yeah. That's what I was trying to do. <laughs> those are, how, those are all, all musky fool flies come off the vice people. Just with, might, might have a little smell of beer to them. No, I'm kidding. But um, I, I, dude, from a commercial standpoint, like when you're banging them out, it's got a consistency and speed. Like it's got a, you know, yeah. it all mixes it up. You get to make brushes, then you get to put them on flies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Even if you're not interested in, in tying the same thing over and over again, I think there's some really cool stuff that you can do. I mean, I mentioned color blending. Um, you can achieve some really, really cool sort of rainbow, you know, like subtle color changes. You can do some more dramatic stuff, you know, with like a, a fire tiger or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the there's a really cool creative aspect to it that if you're if you like tying and if you like experimenting and if you like kind of changing it up a little bit it's a really cool technique and it's, it'll, it'll give something to your flies that you won't really be able to do anywhere else. I think. Yep. So worth, worth checking out for sure. The ones, the ones that I see, the ones that we got here, um, and we got a lot of beautiful ones. Uh, are you, have you experimented? Have you given thought to, and for one reason or another, like putting feathers in, putting flash in, mixing the materials, or is there is there a reason that you like to keep it bucktail? I have no clue. I did that. spin up a brush here that has a bunch of flash in, and you can kind of see that here. Yep. It's absolutely possible. Um, because of the shape of the individual bucktail fibers, it can be kind of tricky to incorporate other kinds of material into that same brush. It's totally doable, and I absolutely recommend folks messing around with whatever they got and what they, what they think is gonna work. Um, Personally, I like just bucktail in that brush because I've got a way of applying things like flash or feathers over the top of that. And the shape of the brush on the, on the shank or the hook kind of gives you that umbrella that you can layer things up onto. So you get a really nice display of whatever that other fiber is going to be, feathers especially. Um, but it's possible, you know, kind of the sky's the limit here. Yep. And then... Um... So I'm going to last kind of just high level question. Are you on these Bufords? Are you like, I'm looking at the, the Buford fly and then I'm looking at the brush and it leads me to believe you're finishing the head with the brush or are you doing that separately? Yep. That's, that's exactly the idea behind the way that those brushes are designed. The ones that are on my side and the ones that I sent to you guys. Um, you have that long fiber here in the back and that's your big fly body. And depending on how long you want your shank to be or how long you want your fly to be, you have excess material up, up front that if you so choose, wrap that right to the eye, tie it off and maybe give it a trim and you're good to go. Um, one of the thoughts I had with, with coming out with these was to give people an opportunity to not only play around with brushes, but make a fly fairly straightforward to tie. If all you really wanted to do was have a couple of these in your box or give it a, give the the brush style of tying a, a go um i'll talk a little bit more about how you can utilize these a little, a little bit later on but yep. there are some kinds of, of ways that you can use them for sure but yeah you're absolutely right that's the idea yeah and you just mentioned something that's interesting like if you were new to tying now you're not going to like necessarily be able to hone your reverse tying technique but if you were new to tying you just want to get into it like this is probably the quickest way to get someone making a musky pattern that fishes well and looks pretty yeah, good. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a nice kind of introduction to not necessarily have to spend 40 or 50 bucks on a fly that you don't really know if you're going to like. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. And if you're like me, when you started out, like you buy all that material and you basically just waste it because you've got to practice, but 
Yeah. You know, it looks like crap yeah, I mean, on the gates. That was kind of the same idea with the tying kits that I've got up on the site too. You know, give give folks a chance to kind of play around with some fairly straightforward patterns, get an idea for what it, it what it even means to make the jump from tying pink squirrels and woolly buggers all the way up to, you know, flies with four aught and six aught hooks on yep. them. Yep. I love it. Okay. Let's um we get we already got a question or two on this, but talk to us about kind of the raw ingredients. And I think the first one, like, obviously it's bucktail, but what kind of bucktail am I looking for? I've heard some, some folks that build brushes say like, oh, I can just use kind of the crappy stuff that you don't like to tie with. I've heard some people roll their eye at that, kind of mm -hmm. where's, where's your head on the matter? Yeah, I mean, it all depends on what kind of taper and what kind of end result you want to have. You can absolutely use, and I brought this for just that reason. So I cut out the middle of this bucktail all of that really short fiber that you never really use for anything. And that gives you something like that, um, that brush that had, where did it go? Here it is. The brush that has this flash in it. Yep. So it's, is it possible? Absolutely. And I definitely use this on some patterns. The, the game changer that I'm tying is one in particular, where if you're trying to fill in some space where you don't necessarily need a lot of the water pushing attributes of that fiber, you just need something to fill out that profile. Something like this will absolutely work. Now, so you're talking little, like these tail sections here. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. There's yep. something coming in the middle. Like Eric, that. by the way, but yep. Yeah. Um, it's that fiber in the middle is a little bit less, you know, it's, it's not going to hold its shape quite as well. Um, you know, and if we're talking about some of those bucktails where you never really want to use them, can you spin them into brushes for sure, but you're still probably going to miss this really, really big profile at the end. So the, the tails that I'm looking for when I'm thinking about, especially when I'm thinking about tying single or double Bufords or game changers or any of those big flies that have that nice umbrella shape to them. Um, we're looking at big, straight. Yep. The good stuff. The really good stuff. Yep. Um, but you're probably using it really efficiently too. Like, right. I mean, you know. pinching, you know, maybe a half inch section of this will will give you almost all of this white section here on the back of the brush. So you're able to use a little bit less material per fly for sure. Right. But having quality materials is always going to give you a higher quality fly for yep. sure. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yep. And that's, that's the name of the game with the, with the big stuff like this. But um, where did I, Oh, I wanted to talk about the other, the other main material here, which is uh, kind of the, the, the thread. Mm -hmm. and or wire you know and can you talk to both of those why 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 you choose one over the other and maybe with each have different applications so this is what i'm using right here power pro 10 pound test just a, a standard braided fishing line yep. the reason the reason for that is um i have found that if you're using a standard dubbing brush table and dubbing wire you have to spin that wire so tightly to hold on to these fibers that you ha you kind of run the risk of shearing those fibers in half and having everything come off the wire. So you might have some things that stick onto the brush, but you're going to have these gaps where you have holes in them and it's not going to give you a nice clean fly at the end of your tie. So using something like Power Pro and then, uh, well, the logo's kind of coming off on here, but just regular old dubbing wax, coating that line with the wax and then applying that your hair and your fiber onto that yep. uh, power pro is what I've been doing. Um, the wire, I, the wire has its application potentially just, it doesn't seem to be a great match for bucktails what you're saying. Yeah, totally. Yep. Um, and just real quick to touch on um, brush tables. Cause I know folks have been asking about that. I did throw up a little tutorial on kind of what I'm using. This is honestly nothing more than wood from the garage and you have a nice wide, six to eight inch surface that you can just remove right out from the middle of your table on one end you're working with just a like a picture frame hook right here and uh, you know th this kind of gets back to another one of those tricks of, of spinning a bucktail brush you can use a regular uh, dubbing brush table but you're probably not going to get the kind of tension that you need when you start spinning everything together because you're either going to snap your power pro or you're going to have uh, fibers kind of fly out on you. So honestly, what I'm doing over here is setting up your line here on the table, putting your fibers down, sandwiching them together, tying a loop knot on the other side, and then 
handheld drill right here. Same kind of um, hook on that end, and that's where you're attaching your line to. Pull your table out from underneath everything and keep your tension as tight as you can. That's kind of the trick between um, a traditional dubbing brush spinner table and what we're, you're seeing here. It's, if you can keep that Power Pro or whatever braided line you're using as tight as possible, you essentially want to be at the breaking point of that line and holding that tension as you're spinning everything as fast as you can. That's kind of the, the if I were to give you a couple of, of tips and tricks, number one would be braided line and number two would be getting that tension as high as possible when you start spinning everything together because that's going to keep the fibers in place and it's going to allow you to sandwich you know individual hairs in that spun material i love how you just casually blew my mind at least with like the here's my own dubbing table that i made you know <laughs> you like a ready-made lasagna you, you want to yeah, talk about okay. yeah local materials was that from a tree in your backyard too <laughs> um, no it, the centerpiece was from an old swing set though oh i love it i love it that's so cool that's good stuff. um have you how does like i'm trying to i'm trying to understand because i don't know a lot about a lot about it but how does what you're talking about change as materials change do i just assume that it is you know tension like i'm gonna have to keep tension but a lot of the a lot of the how-to you just have to kind of get to use to the materials or is this pretty broad stroke applicable you mean as like the the, the different tail fibers change um you're gonna throw other things into the mix yeah i guess i was talking about like you know we're talking about purely bucktail brushes here which i clear you know i i love bucktail just like you but if you wanted to kind of go the more traditional you know synthetic game changer brush route yeah. or kind of the bill Shearer route you know what does it change or Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the reason for that is, especially if you were to compare something like a synthetic fiber, um, you know, like an SF brush, something like that, to what you're using with bucktail, those synthetic fibers are so tiny, like they, they have such a thin diameter that you're able to capture them in something like a wire really tightly without running the risk of snapping them off. Bucktail is actually a pretty wide hair. You know, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is, but like, each individual hair is a pretty robust round um, sort of shape. So that's why I think you, you have a harder time getting a really, really tight wire without breaking those hairs off. Interesting, interesting, okay. Um, that's, you know, let me see if we got any questions on this because I think I saw a few come through because I'm gonna move. Um, so we had one that was belly hair versus body hair preference. So. I think Mark is referring to some of this fiber. Are you using yeah. anything but bucktail? Are you using some belly and body? And do you have a preference? I'm starting to experiment a little bit with some of that, that body hair. Um, I think body hair is going to give you a more length, right? So, or sorry, belly hair, because it's the location of where it is on the animal. Um, that being said, I, you know, I, I'm, because I'm processing all this myself, I'm able to sort of be a little more picky about the cuts that I'm taking. So any of the of the body here that I'm using, I'm trying to get at least that inch and a half length. Oh yeah. It gives you a little bit more to work with. Yeah. It's always easier to trim things down after you've got it onto your shank or your hook. Um, if I had access to belly hair, I would probably only use that, but I'm afraid I just <laughs> haven't found a resource for that quite yet. Yep. No, I mean, what you just showed me though, that that's, that's as good, yeah. if not better than most I've seen. So I think. Yeah. I mean, and that's really, you know, if you were to find a, a, a patch of body hair at a, at a, like a standard shop or something, usually that's designed for tying like popper heads. You're not really going to be able to get the length that you're looking for on these kinds of patterns. Right. Um, you can, and, and it's just much more. Shop, probably not really going to work. Um, yep. So I think finding some of these more niche materials, I think it's going to be your go-to there if you're looking for um, other, other deer hair products for sure. That sounds good. Just doing a time check. Holy cow, it's already 7.30. Um, so I do want to touch on this briefly before we really get into some more of the flies, but like talk a little bit about, you know, we've, we've talked about the brush, we've talked about the raw materials, kind of how to make them. And I know folks will probably love to see some videos, more videos and blog posts from you. So just stay tuned, follow them on Instagram. We'll get into some more of that. We're going to keep it a little high level here just for the sake of it. But talk to us about 
you know, do's and don'ts, tr uh, tips and tricks for actually now applying it. You know, the, the, the actual building the fly with the brush. Sure. Um, yeah, for you, sure. have, you know, um, if you want to spin one up and show it, go for it. We're yeah. Uh, well, let me, let me just touch really, really quick on, on shanks because I know we mentioned that at the very beginning. Um, the flies that I am tying are based on a, a shank to split ring to hook system. Um, I like tying on a shank. It means that I don't stab my thumb every single time. Um, I, you know, just like spinning a bucktail brush, I like the control that you have over the length of each section um, where you have that articulation in your pattern. So that's kind of where my background is with that tying style. Uh, and to give folks an idea, you know, this would be, imagine another hook here in the back, but this is sort of your game changer um, foundation or backbone. Um, I've got one somewhere for, here it is. So for like a, let's say you're tying a double Buford, um, you know, you're running two shanks here with your hook split ringed off the back. Um, and then the brushes that I'm using are all designed to fit on more or less a 55 millimeter shank or yep. a hook shank, right? Yep. Okay. So oh, and, on the double, you're also adding that you're also going hook off the back and then hook at the, the, the joint. Usually going hook off the joint. That, I mean, that's another area where you have control though. You know, yeah. you can run just a single hook off the back. You could run double hooks. It's kind of up to you. But again, that's, uh, I just want to plug it because I think it's cool. A lot of the shank flies that I've seen, um, they're, they're heavy. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a lot of metal. They're a lot of, they're a lot of stuff. And I think everyone, if you don't know, I mean, I'm, the, the hookup capability is incredible, but it's, it's always been a matter of like, man, can you get this thing out there? Um, and you know, it's for some people to go bigger and bigger in the, in the rods, but these are really light and you're kind of, you're kind of hitting it right on the head, which I think is really sweet. Yeah. I know it's kind of yeah. detoured there into the hardware, but that was, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought us there. Um, as just a real quick mention of the, the stainless that I'm using, I'm, I'm making all of my shanks out of stainless and here's a 55 millimeter, yep. and a 35 millimeter. Um, I haven't weighed these side by side. I by side by side, you know, the competition. I don't really know. They're a I, lot lighter than the big game. Way, you know, and you know, I'm I'm using a gauge. I think it's uh, thirty five thousandths of an inch for all my musky stuff. Um, haven't run into any issues of any of that breaking off or anything like that. So, I think I think you're right. I think it is saving some weight. I think it is. Yeah. Some flies a little bit easier to cast. Um, but sure, so let's talk a little bit about the application. I'm, what I do want to do is tie this onto a shank really quick because I know there are some folks that have been waiting to see how you do all of this. Um, if you have picked up any of the tying kits I've got on the site, you're basically looking at, um, let's see if I can get this a little bit closer. We're going we're gonna to start with a 55 millimeter shank. I've already tied on some feathers and flash. Here's that shank again. So this is what I've got in the vise. And you, uh, just tie, you just throw like a standard wrap of bucktail off the back, the standard kind of hair feather flash. To yep. Start. Yep. So clump of bucktail. I've got four slapping feathers here and then a pinch of flash. And um, my wife asked me to plug this really quick. Huge shout out to all the wives and girlfriends out there for um, bringing up these little tools. You can find these in uh, somebody's purse or your, your drawer in the bathroom or probably in the car. If you don't have any of these butterfly clips, find some because these are probably the most invaluable tool. Damn it, now Jen knows where they're going, dude. Shit. So, <laughs> get everything out of your way so that you have room to work. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at here. Love it. We're gonna take this brush and we're gonna tie in the short end here. And by short end, I mean the short end of that Power Pro. Yep. Um, this end of the brush is where the longest fibers are. And we're just gonna tie this. So I've already glued everything in place, but if I wasn't as prepared as I am now, I would suggest that you throw a little drop of um, super glue right on there to really make sure that that connection is good. Trim off any tag end. And then really all you're doing with these brushes is your standard Palmer wrap. There's really nothing that much more complicated about it other than the fibers are really long and they're kind of, 
kind of hard to deal with because they are so stiff that they aren't going to want to necessarily stay in place. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, the real trick is just practice here, like practice your wraps. Um, but I'll give you a couple of, of tips here to hopefully help that out a little bit. The first one is have as much tension on this brush as you can as you're starting to wrap everything together. Just like anything else in, in tying any kind of fly, the more tension that you have usually means that things aren't going to start moving around on you. So if you keep this nice and tight, that'll give you a little bit extra control with your offhand to be pulling and massaging these fibers backwards. And so from here, um, oh, and the other tip I want to mention is I find it a little bit easier to wrap toward me. So this is going to be backwards from your perspective, but it's essentially a reverse wrap. And I find that to be beneficial because I can have a little bit more control of how those fibers are going to come down and around the shank so that I can make sure I get everything palmered to the back of the shank toward the vise so that I don't have a bunch of fibers getting overlapped. Mm -hmm. So we'll just kind of take a look at how that, how that goes. So your first wrap around the shank might not have a whole lot of fibers on it, but by the second or third wrap, you really want to pinch those fibers back, pull them backwards, and then lay that brush down just like that. And really, you're just going to repeat that process. Pinch those fibers backwards, pull them toward the back of the hook, and then fold that up over the top. And it, once you get going, these fibers do kind of start to behave themselves. Obviously, the, you, know, you know this better than anyone. Keep stroking those fibers backwards, right? Jen knows. Jen knows. Yeah, that's all you have to do to be a good tire. I would the the little pinch move you have there is the like, hey, I've done this a few times. That's kind of the key, and it's I I'm trying to make sure you guys can see that as close as you can. No, we got it good. It's at least I can see it good. Yep. Every time you know every wrap, you're pulling those fibers backwards. You can even pinch the whole thing and roll that so you're tightening that thread or you're tightening the the core of the brush around the shank, and that can also really help you. So you're Again, takes a little bit of practice, but you're pinching those fibers back, you're uh, tightening that brush around the shank, and you're also pulling everything backwards so that everything stays nice and tight on here. And I'm going to wrap this right up until I get to those short fibers. As you mentioned earlier, the front of these brushes looking just like a Buford head. We're going to get right to that point, and I'm going to throw a couple of wraps in to tie this off because now I want to talk a little bit about some of the other things that you could be doing here. Um, you know, when I'm tying most of my flies, I don't usually leave that section of, of uh, Buford head at the front. Um, just kind of depends on what kind of color pattern I'm going for. But um, in this instance, if you wanted to, so all I did there was I tied this off. You could wrap this all the way to the front and be good to go. If you, if you wrapped right to the eye of the shank, that would create your Buford head and you'd be done, right? You, what you could do here, and what I occasionally do on some of my other flies, is either stop and trim this off and set that aside, or just keep your tail end of your brush hanging here. But this is a great time to throw in a little bit of flash. Yeah. Maybe a couple of, of cheek feathers if you want. Yep. You want a little bit of extra variability. Um, but you know, that, that's kind of why I like this system. It's really up to you. Um, but that would be my other suggestion would be, you know, a little bit of flash, maybe one or two more, or two or four more feathers right up here. Depending on what your ultimate- Or you could, is, and you could finish it without, you know, maybe you don't want to tie Buford. Maybe you want to right. put some laser dub or finish it with a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or let's say you just wanted it to be a regular bulkhead. Well, then wrap that right to the front of the eye or right to the eye of your shank and, and call it a day. So would this is the same. To, would you have to have a different brush. brush to do that? You would have to have maybe a little bit longer brush or maybe just start the brush closer. Yep, yep, right? okay. But if you trim off that front section, now you just have your standard bulkhead shape. Um, I'm gonna finish this up to the front just so you can see what that Buford head looks like. But that's really how these work. And, I don't know if we have any questions on. We do. I'm going to, I'm going to, while you're doing that and people are answering or uh, watching, I'm going to go through. So just a quick one. Uh, hey, Mike, thanks for joining us. Uh, does Eric have a video showing how to make a brush? 
Eric? Uh, it's, it's coming. I just posted today some of the details of the brush table that I was showing you guys. Um, so I would encourage you to head over to weightsandmeasures.co and check that out. That'll give you a little bit of a head start. I've got some uh, media in the works that's going to show you more of that actual process. But yeah, that's absolutely on the way. Awesome. And we will, um, when we post the video, I'll coordinate with you, Eric. I mean, we'll, we'll make sure, you know, we can include some of that stuff in the email we send everybody. If you got links to it, just so they have it all right there. But we'll, that's, that's good to know. There you go. Anything else anyone's wondering about? Oh, that? I was just, I'm just in awe at the fraction of the time it took you to tie a fly compared to the shit I deal with. But anyway, uh, what do we got here? That was pretty impressive. Do you control the density of the Buford heads with how tight you wrap the brush or density of hair in the brush or both? It's, it's probably a little bit more in the density of the brush. When I'm applying any of these onto a hook or a shank, I want them to be as tight as possible. If you have a bunch of loose wraps in here, you have a higher tendency of all of that to come unraveled or to sort of lose its shape a little bit. Um, so for something like, like uh, fiber density, you're absolutely gonna want to be playing around with how much material you, you've got in the, on the brush in the first place. That's a good question though. I'm Derek and PA, what's up Derek? Thanks for joining us. Um, what do we got here? Steven's got a question. So, He's talking about, he's out in Washington state where they got a bunch of uh, hybrids, tiger muskies and lakes and presenting a profile at the end of the strip is the difference between a strike and a follow. So have you experimented with brushes as it relates to movement or do you see, do you see different ways to go about that, achieve different end results? Yeah, 100%. If I don't, if we don't answer that, I don't know if I understood it too, Steven, before he answers, hit me again and we'll, we'll try again, but I think, I think we got you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, let me just show you this really quick so that you can see, you know, what this looks like at the end of that Buford head. I mean, I obviously didn't trim anything off at all, but, and it's still a little bit kind of scraggly, but so, there you have your big profile. You're, I'm kind of losing some of these green fibers in the camera, but you're having that nice big profile right up to the Buford head here. And then there you go. There's, there's the fly that we're talking about. And honestly, like you don't even have to touch that with the scissors if you didn't want to. You can you can trim it up nice. Right. But she's yeah, I mean, ready to go. Um, but as you're talking about presentation and the way these are going to move, um, great question because what you could I mean you have you have the the tools you know in your hands right. You could leave this just as it is. You could trim this way down. So if you if you left this as it is, this is going to be a great top water. You're going to get a lot of movement depending on what kind of line you're running. This is probably going to be more of a yep. surface level. Super, super buoyant. Super buoyant. Um, you could trim those down, which I've done on this one a little bit, so you get a bit more of a cone shape. Um, still more of a traditional Buford head, but you can see how that's blending a little bit more into the taper. Um, and you could go an another step further where you're just taking off that Buford head altogether. So you have these kind of three different options from one brush application that's going to give you three flies that are all going to behave a little bit differently. Oh, and I, I mean, just there's several more even, right? Like throw a popper head on there, throw a square foam head. So right, that's um. So that's another thing I, I forgot to grab. But um, in this in this case, obviously we're tying a single Buford, right? If you pair two of those brushes together, now you're looking at a double Buford. And depending on how you connect your shanks or your hooks together, if you can see in here that connection, that's just a split ring. So if I wanted to, I could take this top section off. And I could run just a single Buford here off the back. Can you still this. have the, can you, can you open up the middle of that again? Cause you had a little, you mm -hmm. something interesting in there. You had like the, yep, yep. Yeah. So you so, had the, the dense kind of Buford head fibers in the body. Oh, which, right, right. Yeah. Yep. Which kind of reminds me of like Eli's who we're talking to next week's, mm -hmm. how he puts the popper reverse in the middle of the sure. optimal twine. Uh, right. But then, yeah, yeah, you can obviously make yeah. two flies or one, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm usually. Or change colors. You could be like, oh, I want this orange yeah. one head. My, yeah. sorry, I'm, my, I, I like, I like, you spurred some ideas there. Well, that's, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of the whole system, right? Is that you have, if you had, let's say you had six of these sections and you had, you know, a white, a black and a gray or something in the middle, or you had 
a top water, you had something with a little bit of weight, and you had something with a huge modular dumbbell on the top. Now you're taking that more or less that one fly that you tied, even though it might be two or three sections, and you're able to fish it almost anywhere that you want in the water column without necessarily having to worry about changing your line or mm. you know, changing your approach necessarily. Yeah, or you just, you, you know, you're on a budget and you can't get 300 flies and two rods with two lines. And you, I mean, that's, you know, I, I think a lot of this sport can be a little expensive and awesome to make it accessible. Or just like, I know it's probably obvious to folks listening, but we've had a few guests talk about dragon tails. Like sometimes they just throw those dragon tails on. Right. You could build tails, have feathers, dragon tails, et cetera, et cetera, and actually go to work on that. I mean, you could tie the same back section, but rather than having, you know, these medium feathers, maybe you just have a couple of really short ones. So your fly now has this length to it. Absolutely. Awesome. Good. Do we, uh, Steve, let us know if we hit that. Um, I, I, I definitely took Eric off topic a little bit there, so my apologies. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, do you ever steam your bucktail flies before trimming to get the hair to stand up straight? Um, no. Me I could. I think I'm probably lazy, and I know that the, the fiber is going to change a little bit as soon as it gets wet. Um, it's 100% doable. Yeah, you, you totally can. And if you want to, you know, I, I have heard of, of people taking some of those really wavy bucktails and steaming them to get straighter fibers and having that shape hold a little bit better. I can't say I really mess around too much with that though. Yep, fair enough. I can't say I do either. Um, let's see what else. I had a few more here. Um, we talked about that. We talked about, we're covering that. Do, do, do. What else do we do more here? Um, what else do where else do we want to go let's talk about this if and keep the questions coming guys but um we've we've gotten really like how to tactical on the on the um making of these flies but let's just zoom out and talk about kind of what you're looking you know what you're looking for out of these flies in terms of movement on the water yeah you know talk a little bit about how you're rigging up for them what you find pairs well i mean we obviously, we know it's a classic Buford, but because it's got this pretty large twist on it, um, I expect yeah. there to be some differences. And then of course, we got the, the bucktail changer here too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, because I'm in the West Metro of the Twin Cities, I'm fishing a lot of lakes. And so I'm kind of using, well, sort of depends on what lake you're hitting, but if you're trying to catch deep lake muskies, you're probably not really gonna do it on a fly rod. You know, you just can't get down deep enough. Um, and so I'm usually kind of fishing a sort of intermediate sink two, sink four, and, and fishing something like a single Buford so that you're getting a bit of a combination of top water. And as you start to get closer to the boat, then it starts to get down a little bit deeper. Um, or throwing things on a heavier grain, deeper sinking line, and um, just sort of fishing that middle to about as deep as you can get, depending on how far you can cast. Yep. And I would say, I mean, I'll just speak from me throwing these, and I love your, but like, even these doubles, 10 weights, oh, yeah. not a problem. I mean, I didn't have an issue on, on the Chippewa 10 weight. That's not really a true 10 weight, but, uh, you know, toss. Um, I, had, I had a lot of fun uh, throwing these on my Chippewa. So shout out to Thomas and Chippewa River Custom Rods. I mean, you guys are watching are, are aware of that guy and all the cool stuff he's doing. But I was fishing his four-piece 10 weight, which I think is a little bit – so if, if you consider his one-piece 10 – as probably being a 12. I think the four piece 10 weight is more of a true 10 weight. Um, but I had no trouble casting all this stuff all summer long. So you, I, I, this is like off, it's kind of, I mean, it's musky, so I guess it's on topic, but you, uh, cause that's the same rod we're selling, his Chippewa 10 four piece. Yep. And I always like to ask people cause they fish it very differently. So you're rigging it up with 10 weight line. Or yeah. are you, are you well, lining up? Because we've been we've been tossing four fifty on there. I think it's yeah. I don't. It's not four fifty. It's either three fifty or four hundred. It's a little bit right. lighter, um, but that gives me the ability to, to play around with a little bit more of small mouth and large mouth. Sure. Well, and it's just it's all. I think it, I've seen it. Just having folks cast them in front of me, it's casting stroke. A lot of you know, if you have a, a more of a smooth, methodical uh, cast tends to work better with that 380 and 400 
um, you know, if you're trying to, to rip it, um, right. 450, 425, which yeah. Yeah, n- neither one is good nor bad. It's just, it's just something to think about because we've had some folks cast them and they haven't loved it. I'm like, well, I think we got to dial up the line then. So that's interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so let's get back to that game changer a little bit because that was a that was something that I had a lot of fun experimenting around with over the winter, and I think I've really kind of landed on a cool combination of bucktail, body hair, brushes, not brushes, uh, all of that. And it really, it's really starting to come together in in a fly that I think is really easy to cast. If you hold that up against other game changers. It's a little bit shorter. It's, it's only, you know, it's, I usually tie them between 10 and 12 inches. So it's a little bit shorter fly. Um, again, makes it maybe a little bit easier to cast something that you could throw in a 10 weight. I fished that on a 10 weight all last summer and didn't have any issues. Um, that iteration is using a little bit less material. So I'm trying to find ways to make that pattern, which I think if anyone's fished any kind of game changer at all, they're so much fun to watch. And that's kind of what really gets me is that you see that thing coming at you in the water and you're like, oh, this is it. Every, every retrieve is going to be, oh, here, here it comes. And so that's why I love, I love tying them. And then you're like, oh, I got to cast it again. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I hear you. No, I hear you. <laughs> but anyway, I'm trying to find ways to make that a little bit easier on this large of a scale for folks to be casting all day. Um, and so if you hold that up again, you can kind of see that profile. Oh, yeah. Rather than it being, you know, Two hooks like you said earlier, all the way down, I I took the taper down right after the first couple of sections, and I just added some shorter fibers off the back to give you just enough material that it's going to catch water and it's going to move really well, but you're saving a ton of that weight and you're saving all that water attention right there. Yep. And just for folks wondering, we are, what are these? Uh, P R three twenties six o. Uh, it's a six o. Yeah. It's, 320 in the front. It's a V10 Stinger. Uh, a rear one. I think it's a two or two or a four in the back. Okay, and then he's got one, two, three, four shanks. Hook, yeah. shank, hook, shank, shank, shank. So it's a six section fly. Um, yeah, super fun. Yep, awesome. Um, well, and the other thing you have going, which I know, I know Blaine has a few of them as well, and others are time, but um, the bucktail change your combo I think just runs a little bit lighter because it sheds water a little bit better than your synthetics that can get a little soaked up it, obviously different synthetics resist water differently than others but yeah of course um, you know I, I've always been really drawn to natural fibers that's just kind of my my style you know like the the colors of bucktail that I'm dying over here are all these like chestnut browns and I call this one Malbec because it's kind of this like dark purpley red. Uh, I came out with some really, really cool sort of yellow greens. Um, Dirty money. I love that color. If no, I couldn't, I couldn't. Yeah. I've got, yeah, I've got that here in the front of the well, book. That's just olive stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but here's the uh, here's the feather version of that dirty money. I think this is so cool. I mean, it's it's hard to pick up on a on a camera, but you've got elements of brown, elements of olive, like olive drab, army green. You've got a little bit of that like Kelly green chartreuse coming down the center. Um, these things are just so much fun to play around with, and that that to me is you know I every fly that I tie, I I like to put a little bit of personality into and and have it tell a bit of a story and. I'm hoping that I'm doing that with, with the materials that I'm sourcing, with the, with the effort that I'm putting in to, to dye them and, and sort of curate the selection. But I just really like yeah, that. Element you of, can definitely tell, man. Like I, I, I say that to a couple other folks we've had on, like everybody has a little bit of, you know, just mm-hmm. contrast like what Matt at Adaptive is doing with some of his like one-off flies that are crazy kind of psychedelic colors to this like, really really you know it's, it's your style like it's just i don't know how to explain it other than like getting to know you a little bit it's like this is eric's style it's eric's yeah. kind of color runs and yeah, yet you know yet it's still fish proven patterns you got black and orange you got you know whites and and natural greens that look like forage fish so it's not like yeah so just props on that i'm, I'm a fan of it cool 
Thanks, man. Um, we got a couple more here while, while, we, while we're uh, still, still got some time left. And can you, you got a hard stop? Can we go a few over? Yeah, we're good. We got a little good? bit. My man, awesome. Um, so James has got a question for you. When making a brush with longer fibers, how much of the butt ends are on one side of the braid? Good question. <laughs> Uh, one one thing that if you're if you have the ability to do this at with, you know with your table, um, let me clean this up a little bit. This is what the top of my table looks like, and I've got a, a line running down the center where I've got that line sitting on, and then I have a couple of incremental. These are just inch marks that I can see as I'm as I'm building. I always build from the longest end over here to the shortest end, but honestly, it. This is going to be like the answer everyone hates to hear, but it depends on what you're trying to do with it. If you want something that, if you're trying to take advantage, as much advantage of that long fiber, which might be the question, you can get away with like a quarter inch. You don't have to have a whole lot of that fiber overlapping for you to be able to capture it with your braided line. Um, but keep in mind, you're building the taper of your fly as you're laying these fibers down on, on here. So it's not just that you're trying to get as much length out of it. You think, make sure you're thinking about the shape of the, of your end result, right? If that makes sense. Yep. Most of the time with the, and you can kind of see, if you look at the very center of these, you can sort of see, you know, quarter inch on this side, quarter inch on this side, there's a sort of yeah. a half inch core down the center that's giving you that. So that's, that's where you can see the overlap. Um, I think, the more overlap you have, the more you're going to end up with sort of a, a profile and a density that's maybe not quite what you're looking for. As you wrap these things onto your hook or onto your shank, whatever you have overlapping is still going to stand out. It's mostly going to be hidden by the longer fibers in the background, but you're still going to be building up that core in the center. So perhaps you're looking for something that has a really dense middle with just a few sparse edges. Maybe you just want something that has very little on the on the shank and as much of that length as possible. It really kind of depends on what you're looking for. But yeah, good question. For the most part, it's about a quarter inch, quarter inch or less. Oh, the other thing I want to talk about is these because I just think these are so cool. I was messing around with one this morning. So I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this so you can stop me, but it's it's the Buford. Please. The um, so when I first got, uh, the little background here is when I first got to know Eric, see his flies, see his style, you know, it was like very intrigued. And then when I learned he was tying Buford heads with the brushes, I was really intrigued. Cause there, I don't know about you guys, but maybe it's just me. When I tie Buford heads, it's a freaking mess. Like I, I, I do it with, uh, you know, belly hair. I do it with some body hair, but it's fibers all over the place. And it's, you do, you do enough of them and it just, I want to hit that consistency. And I was like, oh, wow, I think Eric's onto something. So yeah. he's, he's working a few of these up, which are just Buford head brushes. I've got some really nice great. Yeah, the, which I think is, I think this could be sweet. I'm yeah. definitely, I'm definitely a fan of these. Um, so these are something that I've just started playing around with. Um, I, I really only recently started getting my hands on um, really good body here that I'm, I'm able to, to dye and process. Um, but I completely agree, agree with you. It, you can sometimes nail it and other times like you'll tie a clump in and you'll get past it and you look back at it and you're like, no, that's yeah. not going to work. I got to take it all the way off. <laughs> I got to yep, undo, unwind it. Yep. 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 Um, and so, yeah, that's, you know, it's absolutely another element where you can control the length of those fibers onto a brush. And then once you spin that brush onto your hook or your shank, you're going to have a really consistent, really clean. And that, that was the piece that I loved. Cause like for, so for the, the, the Bigfoot Buford kind of musky fool version that we sell, we, I keep it really sparse. Cause I, I just, that was the movement I was looking for with that fly. But when I'm tying stuff personal, you know, sometimes you want the bulk of your head. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want no, barely anything there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, gets difficult to replicate over and over again when you're just like, ah, let me grab a pinch. Well, maybe it's two pinches. Maybe it's three. Right. And like with this, yeah. you know, you can just, you can really hone that in. So I think these are really cool. More to come on these, Eric, yeah. for folks. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. We'll have these up on, on my side by the weekend. You've got a handful in your hands, but I'll be Yeah, I'm not letting go of these though. Sorry guys. I got, 
<laughs> he only gave me a few and they're going to um, stick in the damn box, but we got a lot of other good stuff from Eric. Um, you know, the other thing I want to mention on those heads is that, you know, if you're tying a Buford head in particular by pinching just those longer or those sorry, the shorter fibers from the base of the tail, um, I was finding that I was getting a lot of color variation here. And so I was trying to find a way to have something where, and I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but like, I usually find that about this much of the tail is good for Buford heads. Yep. Anything beyond maybe those first, maybe two inches starts getting into that really, really thin kind of wispy fiber. That's not really going to, it's not going to flare like you wanted to, and it's not going to be as buoyant. So if you're able to use something like body or belly hair, you can get a much more consistent color. I think you have a lot more of that material at your disposal so that, you know, I, I, have, I have a handful of flies where I just like, I felt like I nailed the color scheme. It just has the perfect gradient from dark to light or light to dark, but I'll never get that again because I, cl I clipped those three pinches off the base of the tail that were the only good <laughs> colors that I was looking for. Yep. So that's where that comes from too, is, is yep. it's going to be a little more consistent, but also have, you know, that color fade or that you know that consistent color that you're looking for or even like the just the the stiffness of the fibers if you have three clumps of a, of a um, body or belly or patch I just feel like you're going to get a more consistent fiber in there as well well and I, I started to run into this once I woke up and started getting good bucktail like the better bucktail you get the less good Buford head tail you get Nice. So you you kind of have to either or, honestly if you're if you're spending that much for really good bucktail you don't really want a bunch of hollow short fibers on the bottom no and you don't so necessarily want to chip into it when yeah. belly hair and body hair is just a lot more efficient and cheaper right. for that for sure yeah, yeah totally. uh, we did get a few other ones here du, 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 du. Uh, talk about durability I think that's a good question from Nick versus a standard tied bucktail like a reverse tied you know method How, what yeah. plus yeah. minus um. I think it really comes down to the, the strength of your brush. If you are able to get that Power Pro or, or whatever braided line you're using really, really tight before you start, you know, getting everything kind of to unwind on you. Um, I haven't had any issues with fibers coming out of there. It's going to act just like any other brush that you would be making with wire. Um, but I think the same, same thing is true of a reverse tie. You can have a really great reverse tie that's not going to go anywhere. Or if you have a little bit of slack in your thread that could come on undone on you altogether yeah uh, would this be a fair like i would i would maybe say like using some of the glue in your reverse tying is probably the same importance as like the dubbing wax like if you're not dubbing waxing the, sure. your, that stuff's just gonna slip yeah i mean the the wax, on, the wax on a brush is not really holding the fibers in the brush it's holding it in place while you wrap the thread around itself so as long as you get a really nice tight wrap you know, the having a good base of wax is going to keep everything, you know, very perpendicular to your braided line, which is another, another key. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all about the, the, how you're, how you're spinning everything together. And then we have another one from Antonio. Uh, he sounds like he builds tons of brushes with wire, never done it with Power Pro. He wants to know, how you effectively, how are you sealing this? I thought you mentioned it earlier, but, and I see yeah, so, some knots and stuff, but talk folks through the kind of like wrapping up the brush to make sure it doesn't come apart. So if you want to maybe add one more disadvantage to a, to a power pro brush or a braided line brush, the one that I would say is that once you clip it off of your fly, you, you either have to put it somewhere where you don't touch it, or use it again right away because this end is going to start coming undone and then all these fibers are just going to come right off of there. Um, so you don't have the advantage of a wire brush where you can clip it and the wire twisted around itself is going to hold everything together so that you can start. Yeah, right from I hear you. Wire, wire still seems to kind of, once you clip the brushes, it still kind of gets unruly, at least on me. But yeah. I yeah, hear you. I same hear you. thing is true, just to a greater extent on something like with a braided line. Okay. Now you can get around that. So I guess if we're just talking about clipping a brush off and then continuing to use it, as long as you, I mean, the, the one trick that I would suggest would be pulling out maybe an eighth of an inch of that fiber so that you just have the end of that Power Pro. Maybe you can see that there. 
and that's what you're tying in. So as long as you're tying everything in really tightly, and in some cases applying a little bit of super glue or zappa gap or whatever your preferred yeah, method. That was one of the questions. So good. that's how it goes. So when I tie these in onto the hook or onto the shank, it's a bunch of really tight wraps. I'm also always using like a really strong GSP thread, something that you can really torque down on. And then a couple of drops of, of your adhesive or glue or whatever. And then that's gonna hold your first end in place. As you're wrapping that on, it's really important to have everything nice and tight. And then once you finish that off, whenever you're at your eye or wherever you wanna stop using that brush, tight wraps, clip the excess brush off, and then a couple of drops of glue will help seal that on there. Okay. Um, and what was this one again? Sorry if you already said it. I just, I didn't catch it. We got another question. The actual, and you're doing it on, I don't mean to hold the Buford up, but uh, like the knots that you have here just to keep this clean, is this just, it looks like just a non-slip loop? That's just an overhand knot. Yep. The oh, knot oh, this is an overhand knot. And then, yeah, 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 and yeah. then yeah, so you're then, yeah. And I, I can cover some of that, some of the knot stuff in the brush making stuff, but um, the knots are not really what's holding anything together. It's the tightness of your thread wraps on the, on the twisted line that's gonna hold everything in place. Once you get that tight on there and you throw some glue on it, you're good to go. It's not gonna come on down on you. Roger, roger that. Good question. Uh, Mitch, we hit that one. Derek, uh, Derek, on the, um, I think he's, so just talking about the, the kind of the Buford head section of the brush, are the heads 50-50 on the brush or are you doing quarter inch one side? Like like the when you're laying it down on the and making oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Pretty it's, even to me, but you it's, yeah, you, it's about 50-50. Yeah. I'm I'm usually so when I'm laying down long fibers, I'm positioning the, the tips of the fibers, you know, off the wire. And then you have like the butt ends that you would clip off the tail. That's what's sitting right on on the wire or I'm sorry on the um Mono, right. uh, when I'm um adding fibers for just the head component I'm actually reversing that so it's this it's the flat butt end that I cut off that I want to have be maybe a half inch off the line and I care a little bit less about the tail or the tip end because that flat flush cut that I'm making off the off the skin is what's going to give you that nice round shape yep you don't want the skinny yep, yep. you end up trimming that down anyway all right, I think this is a great one to end it on. Um, does Eric have a favorite tying beer? Oh, anything from Modest Brewing. I'll give them a quick shout out. If you're from the Twin Cities, look these guys up. This is my, not when I'm not furloughed and in the pandemic, this is my day job right here uh, in operations, but. Um, We're gonna have to get up there and check some of that out. I don't think I've, I've had a modest, modest Brew. You gotta get up here, man. Hell yeah, we're gonna make that happen this year. Um, dude, this is like knowledge overload, super packed. I think people are itching, if, at least I know I am, to get more more info from you uh, on, on how to do this shit and check out all, all the good stuff you got going on. Any kind of send off, final words? Um, yeah, I mean- Up for you yeah, in 21? Thank you guys for having me on. This was a lot of fun and- Yeah, um, we had a blast. I hope we didn't cover too much information. Ah. Um, if there's anything that we didn't get to that people still are asking or wondering about, uh, send them my way or feel free to hit me up on Instagram or something. Um, always happy to answer questions or help folks out. So you can find, well, you'll have links to all my stuff on, on the event page, but weightsandmeasures.co and uh, weightsandmeasures.co on Instagram. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, brother. Well, this was awesome. Again, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the flies, the brushes, and spitting some some bucktail knowledge. Uh, we're gonna have to get out on the water here soon. So Absolutely. Yeah, let's, we'll make it happen. Let's cross cross reference some calendars. <laughs> let's do it, man. Thanks everybody for joining. Everyone right. have a great night. We'll see ya. No Bye. Problem. Oh, hey Siri. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>